And Jeffrey, usually the first question is, why? Um, why would you do this? Uh, and I do it because I am incredibly proud to have been born and raised here in San Francisco. My wife and I are raising two young children here. We have a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. And I want them to be as proud to be from San Francisco as I've always been. And the direction that our city is heading in leaves me worried that they won't have that same sense of pride. And so that's why uh, I jumped in. The, the thing that you're going to hear a lot about um, uh, in this race, if you've read about me or if you haven't, but as you read more, uh, is the first thing that they say these days is Levi's. That's the first thing you read. And I run towards that. Um, and it's because my parents got divorced when I was two. Uh, my mom remarried my stepfather, Peter Haas, who is part of the Levi Strauss family. And especially in a, in a room like tonight, I think um, uh, this community appreciates it. I grew up at a company that provided rights to its LGBTQ community long before it was required by law. Uh, Levi's jumped in during the AIDS crisis and funded um, medical care at SF General uh, before anybody else. I grew up in the 80s watching uh, family, friends, and employees suffer through that crisis. And so if someone comes at me on Levi's, I'm all in. It's a great San Francisco company. It benefited from being in San Francisco. And the city benefited from having Levi's here. But Jeffrey, you're not, and many people in this room, you're not going to hear a lot about the fact that my dad uh, was a rabbi at Temple Emmanuel. Uh, before I was born. He helped tens of thousands of Jews flee persecution uh, from places like Ethiopia and Russia uh, in the 80s and 90s. So I watched my father help people he had never met before. Um, uh, my mom was always focused on early childhood education because we know that when a child gets off to the right start, they do better their entire lives. And so I'll, I'll stop there. I just wanted you to know my values where they come from and what led me to start Tipping Point Community in, in 2005. We've raised over a half a billion dollars to tackle issues of poverty. We can get into that tonight. And I came, it came to the mayor's attention, the work I was doing, Mayor Lee, and he asked me to chair the bid for Super Bowl 50, uh, which I did in, from 2013 on. We went up against Miami. We beat Miami. Those were the days where we were winning and beating Miami. Um, and we brought the game here in 2016, brought $240 million worth of economic revenue. And those are, that's a number. Um, we put $13 million back into the community, making it the most philanthropic Super Bowl ever. Uh, we made sure that LGBTQ small businesses were engaged and involved in delivering that game the first time in NFL history that LGBTQ companies were uh, invited to be participating in the small business part of the bringing the Super Bowl here. So I'm really proud of, of all of that. Great. You know, you talked about your upbringing, I think, for so many of us that have started to get your mail. Um, and we, we see the big billboards um, in the, uh, around the city. You know, there's something very visceral, I think, for a lot of us that, you know, here's someone that uh, has a huge family wealth. Mm -hmm that is um, coming in, um, kind of like a Michael Bloomberg of San Francisco, um, to buy his way mm -hmm. into City Hall. Jeffrey, I, how you put that, I really appreciate. I really appreciate how you asked that question. And I get it. And you all are going to have to judge me on, on, on many things. And, what, and I'll, tell, I'll tell you, um, my, my, my daughter came home from school uh, in the fall. And she's like, Daddy, I learned about chance and choice. And we started talking. And it applies here because, as I said, uh, you know, when you're two years old and your parents get divorced, you don't have a lot of choice in what happens. Um, and so it was by chance how I grew up. And I won't run from it, like I just said. I'm proud of my stepfather's legacy, who's no longer with us. I have three other great parents still alive. And I'm going to ask all of you, really, I'm going to ask all of you to judge me on the choices I've made with my life. 
And at every single turn, I have devoted my life to serving the community. Every door that has been open for me, I have tried to bring as many people along with me as possible. This election, I agree, there is no buying any election. That's why you're not going to see a candidate work harder than me, be out in every single community. I've had 100 house parties. We were knocking doors in the Excelsior last night. I am loving this. I am going to work my tail off. Nothing is given. Nothing is given. Everything is earned. And I intend to earn your support. And I appreciate the question. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I work in public education. So that's one. And you mentioned you have two kids. Um, the reality, though, in San Francisco is we hear the economist report saying the Gini coefficient in San Francisco, which measures inequality, is as bad as it is in Rwanda. Yeah. Yep. You know, your kids might be going to private school versus my nieces and nephews are going to a public school in the Excelsior. Mm -hmm. Their life trajectories are going to be markedly different um, in terms of um, s social, racial segregation. Mm -hmm. Our public schools are down to less than 10% of white kids. In the city, about a third of our under 18 population are Chinese and about a third are white. But in our public schools, there's a plurality of Chinese kids and about 10% white. Mm -hmm. it, is this the San Francisco, you know, we're both San Francisco natives. Is this the San Francisco that we're looking forward to? No, I, so that's, that's why I've, I, I built Tipping Point in 2005. I think, I think how you're asking these questions is exactly right. It's, it's I've challenged this at every turn in my life as well. Um, that's why we focused on education and housing and employment and early childhood education at Tipping Point, because we need kids to get off to the right start to have a shot. Um, so I, once again, I will say at every turn, I am trying to provide opportunities. We started a Tipping Point because in a land as wealthy as the Bay Area, it is unacceptable. It's shameful, the level of poverty. You need four, four jobs to make ends meet, minimum wage jobs to make ends meet in this city and in this region. Over 1.3 million people too poor to meet their basic needs here in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. Unacceptable. And I aim to do what I did uh, in terms of serving the community at a smaller scale and tipping point. I want to serve you all, and I want to serve the community. I want to serve those kids that you're talking about because they deserve every opportunity that I had. Tell, tell me more about Tipping Point. So in my mind, a Tipping Point is there's a social contract that we're trying to get tipped over. So a classic example, I, I'm a Chinese historian, is when China eliminated foot binding. So we had villages that would get... Hmm. Sorry, I'm going to... Would mute that if someone can help me mute that right there. Um, four years after, we're still we're still trying to figure. You know, the tipping point example is you know villagers would come together and um, figure out you know each village is going to band together to stop foot binding, mm -hmm. and then they created a tipping point to create the social contract to stop that really bad practice that mutilates uh, girls' feet. Mm -hmm. um, Tell me more about your example of tipping point. What, what, what have we tipped? Um, the goal in 2005 was that I saw this inequality. I, I saw this level of poverty that I thought was unacceptable. Um, I got together uh, with a couple people and one of the founders of Tipping Point, famous NFL player, Ronnie Lott. Um, uh, he grew up in LA, but he and I and, and two others wanted to get this region committed to issues of poverty, to get the information that you're bringing up tonight out into the wider world, into the business community, to get, you know, we in 2005, um, you know, iPhone hadn't been invented. Um, you know, we were just about to hit another tech boom. We hadn't hit it yet, but we were still an incredibly wealthy, wealthy uh, community. And we thought the business leaders, the community wasn't doing enough. And so, the four of us thought we could start something. We could spark a change in these civic leaders, these business leaders, and, and turn their attention from just making money to giving back and to getting engaged. And, um, you know, we have stories of uh, 
like Visa, uh, was not engaged. Actually, the, the president of Visa spoke at our recent event at Tipping Point and said tip, Visa wasn't doing enough. And then they found out about Tipping Point. They found out, r really, they got into youth homelessness. And they started uh, saying, we need to do more. We're a hometown San Francisco company, and we're not doing enough. And now, look across the ballpark. We have a development where there's 40% of the building going up is affordable. And that's part, partly due to that company and other companies realizing they need to take a stand. They need to do more. So tipping point, besides the fact that we've raised over a half a billion dollars, never taking a government dollar, all coming from individuals and companies. And Visa made, I think, a $12 million commitment uh, over three years to youth homelessness two years ago. Um, and we're seeing good strides on that. Um, it's that type of company, individuals saying, okay, we have a responsibility. If we're going to have you know, our companies here, our employees here, um, we need to get them involved. It's something you know, I also did um, last year with the Civic Joy Fund. We tried to get companies cleaning up neighborhoods, getting involved, helping artists paint utility boxes. At every turn, I'm going to just say it again, at every turn, I have pushed our civic leaders, our business leaders to be involved and to get engaged in the communities. We need everyone. I know this group's involved and engaged. I mean, look at the turnout tonight. Sure. But you know, let me let me pause right there. Yeah. You know, I, I teach AP government before and I don't have a chapter in my AP government book where I teach the kids that, you know, businesses need to get involved and create social movements. What I teach them is that, you know, kids, you know, they start a petition, they go to city hall, they attend public hearings, and they get involved and they create social movements. We see Greta, you know, working on climate change. I guess my question is You don't and you and and you wouldn't push businesses to get engaged? Absolutely. Okay. I think that's part of it, but but the the whole messaging seems to be, you know, let's let's rely on philanthropy, let's rely on businesses. Absolutely. When you're running for mayor. You know, Charlotte Schultz did a great job as chief of protocol for the city and the state. You know, we're, we're not auditioning for chief of protocol to, you know, schmooze with the business community. We want a civic leader that can, you know, this city yeah. is pretty fractious. So let me tell you, I'm the only one in this mayor's race that's built housing. Um, I built a 100% affordable housing building, 145 units on time, under budget with good paying union labor. There's a man there. I'm not going to say his name because he's getting a little too much press. He was on the streets unhoused for 20 years, Jeffrey. He was in a wheelchair. He got keys to the room at 833 Bryant. He's out of that wheelchair now. He's been in that house, his own apartment, for three years. Housed, thanks to what we did at Tipping Point. There's 144 other people like that that are off the streets, in-house, and now he's helping out at Hummingbird doing incredible work. Um, when the North Bay fires hit, Jeffrey, uh, civic leaders, politicians, business leaders called me, called Tipping Point and said, how do we help our neighbors up north? We put oh, yeah. on, con oh, wait, like, yep. it, so $34 million we raised for those that lost their homes. We put that all out in 10 months. Um, you asked about Super Bowl. We put $13 million to work. And by the way, that meant... With that many people coming to town, $240 million worth of economic revenue, our restaurants were full, our bar bars were full. Guess what that meant? That meant people getting jobs, living wage jobs, and getting paid. We need to bring more events. We need to bring conventions back to San Francisco. We need to bring tourism back to San Francisco. We need to bring revenue. I know how to do that. Right. Um, I have one question about, you know, I've, I heard, listened to some of your previous interviews, and you made a huge point about charter reform and cutting down on commissions commission reform um, yeah. you know bureaucratic you know mumble jumbo give us give us a preview of what what that will look well like. i just i commission reform um and so if you heard this then you've read it uh we 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 have a commission currently going and you probably all know this but we have a commission now in place that's overseeing a department that no longer exists okay so we have 130 plus commissions in this city. Uh, many of them are not fully uh, staffed up or have fully commissioned up. And I believe we need to 
cut those. Wh- uh, which top five? Which I, one? I, I think that's up for there. You know, I think we're we're not even sure if it's going to be on the ballot. Um, but uh, I'm going to cut the one. Uh, there's I think three or four overseeing housing and homelessness uh, services. That for me is a, is a problem um, because guess what that means, Jeffrey. When you start a commission, and one of my opponents is, I think, voted on 25 commissions over the last 16 years, it allows our elected leaders to point fingers and to say, oh, it's not on my watch. That's, the, that's up to the commission. And it's what we're getting from all of our elected leaders. It's a master class in finger pointing. I am tired of the blame. And Jeffrey, what I want everybody in this room to hear is next year when I take office and something goes wrong in this city, I'm going to be the one to hold myself accountable. You are not going to see me blaming the Board of Supervisors or the DA or the police chief or the commissions. I am going to be a leader that you can hold accountable. I'm going to hold my department heads accountable because the spending is out of control. They have not held the groups and the contractors and the nonprofits to account. Everybody wants to blame all the nonprofits. We got to start with the department heads and you start with the mayor. Don't worry, we will, and we'll. I'll be the first one there. <laughs> but you know, we have we have two members of our board, and I wanted to give them a, a quick moment to ask questions. Um, first, we have Sydney from our Trans Caucus, who would love to ask a question. Let's check the mic, mic, mic. Isn't that the broken one? No, I think we can hear. It's it working. Perfect. Yeah. I can hear. You. Nice. Can you guys hear me? Okay, sweet. Um, Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, Sydney with the Trans Caucus again. Um, What specific policies and initiatives do you plan to implement to ensure the safety and protection of trans people in San Francisco, particularly our black transgender community? I I was reading a statistic that trans and LGBTQ make up 38% of our homeless population and yet only 12% of our population that, you know, total population. Um, I may work with groups like I have in the past, uh, like Larkin Street. We need to make sure that when people come to San Francisco to love who they want to love, who they want to love, to be who they want to be, that we remain that beacon, that we, because these attacks trans uh, are under attack nationwide. We all know this. They're under attack in parts of the state of California. It's unacceptable. Hate can have no ability to be in this. I will, I will stand up for trans rights and I will work with groups like Larkin to make sure that kids don't fall into homelessness because once, once we do, once they do, once anybody falls into homelessness, mental health, addiction sets in very quickly. That's why last week I announced a plan to stand up 15,000 shelter beds, emergency shelter beds immediately. We cannot allow our kids to stay on the streets any longer. And that's been a policy choice that we've made to allow people to come here and not have a safe place. And so that's where I would start. Groups like Larkin Street, it's a program that was in the paper today, Rising Up, which I got behind a number of years ago. We need to do more programs like that. And that's where I would start with our youth. Thank you for the question. Next, you know, Gwen Craig, who you met a little bit at our Harvey Milk Day event, and thanks for being oh, there. Yeah. But Gwen is our pioneer, and I'm going to ask Gwen to come up and ask a question also. Let's give it up for Gwen. Gwen is, without Gwen, most of our LGBTQ movement will not be here today, and we are, we are indebted to all of your efforts. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I, I was uh, very interested in a follow-up to something you just said, and it actually concerns me. I, I, I sense this misunderstanding or lack of understanding of how city process works that I think comes with someone who perhaps hasn't had government experience before. I'm very sorry. Um, but when you talked about cutting city commissions, and you said that, um, well, we don't even know what's on the ballot yet. Together SF already has petitions in circulation with their plan to cut city commissions. Now, are you going to get out ahead of that and make your own proposal 
uh, or you're just going to follow along with what they put on the ballot and people maybe vote in, whether you like that or not, uh, to cut city commissions in half. And maybe they don't cut the commissions that you like. Maybe they don't do it in the process that you're outlining here. Um, and if you have a plan, um, when are you going to wait to develop that? Before or after the citizens of San Francisco vote on Well, something? Gwyneth, I, I think uh, I appreciate the question. Um, uh, I was under the impression it's about an 18-month process that they are going to go through if it does indeed make it to the ballot and if it indeed does get passed. So there will be a lot of input. Uh, from the public uh, in this process. Once so it's just, on the ballot, there's no process. We no, well, but then what I've read about it is that then there is an 18-month process after that in which the public will have a say in it. I see. So, okay. I appreciate the question. One final question. Um, you know, you know that we're a progressive organization with this is a ranked choice ballot. Give us your argument for why we should be ranking you on the ballot. Well, I think uh, I don't. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, "I'm a moderate. I'm a progressive." Um, they wake up in the morning and they want to be able to walk their kids to school safely. They want to have their kids get on Muni and feel like they aren't going to be subject to anti-Asian hate. Um, that's what people want. They want common sense. They want a government that works. They want a. They want leaders that listen to them. Don't claim to have all the answers. Um, because I don't, um, but I am committed to having a trans transparent administration, one that listens to the people, that works with the people, and holds our department heads accountable, holds myself accountable, and I will do that. And I think what we're seeing in every poll, every anything that comes up, people just want the city to work again. Um, and I also think they want the city to have fun again. So let's have some fun. Um, and I would love, love if you all would consider endorsing me. I know it's a ranked choice voting uh, uh, race. And so I would, I'd be honored to have your endorsement. And when we invite you to participate in that process. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you so Thank much. You let's give a round of applause for Daniel. All right. Without further ado, we have the mayor, Mayor London Breed, with us. And um, come on up, Mayor Breed. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I, I have to say that I, I thank you so much for your courage for being here. Because you know that we, um, we've not always agreed with a lot of things, but um, being able to talk and share ideas is so important. It's still on my mouth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have to you get your sense of gravity. But you know, I, I ain't scared of nothing. So. And I know that. And so thank you so much. Le thank you for being here. You can't have a mayor that's scared now. Absolutely. So we're, you know, we're going to cut right to it. You know, we've had a lot of disagreements in the past few years, and I think the chief of it is that, you know, we're both native San Franciscans. Um, I know you went to Galileo. I went to Lowell. Um, I grew up in um, Chinatown. You know, we, we, we've seen how the city has changed. And I'm concerned that so many of my peers, people that I graduated with, they can't afford to be in the city anymore. And a lot of us are wondering um, about your policies whether or not it, it's leading to more gentrification. It's leading to more families like mine that aren't able to afford it anymore. Well, Jeffrey, first of all, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. I will start by saying that having a mayor who doesn't know what it feels like to actually have to pay rent um, is not a solution. Uh, but I will also say that you know, the fact is I have been very aggressive with my housing policies mostly because of my experience of growing up in this neighbor, in the Fillmore down the street where there were a lot of decisions made, including the public housing that I grew up in, where there were 300 units when I was growing up, they were torn down and they only built 200. So clearly a lot of people weren't coming back. 
there were a lot of decisions made that were very much problematic. And I know that there is a lot of housing talk going on right now where it's like you're a Yimby or you're a NIMBY or you're this or you're that. I think the problem I have with some of our policies over the decades, they are by design created to make housing more difficult to build, more expensive to build. And what I have tried to do consistently is deconstruct our housing policies to make it easier, to make it easier to get to yes so that we can build housing and not make the mistakes of the past that make it impossible for friends that we grew up to be able to afford to live here. That is what I will continue to do in every policy that I push for. And sometimes I know it's not popular, but it's necessary. We can't keep saying we want to build affordable housing, but with what money? especially when it costs anywhere between 750000 and sometimes up to $1.5 million a unit. That is insane, and it is a problem. And we're not going to be able to get bonds passed enough to keep up with the demand of building affordable housing in our city. We have to make change, and change means completely deconstructing all these decades of housing policies that have clearly failed. Sure. So let's take that apart two ways. One is the planning part. You know, we all saw that crazy rendering of that Slope Boulevard, you know, tower that, you know, right in from the zoo, I don't know, 30, 40 stories. Is that the, is that the road that we're looking towards? Can you give, flesh it out for us? What, what do you mean by, you know, deconstructing? Thank you. Policies? I appreciate you bringing up this topic because the planning department put out a map the map that they put out was based on what potentially could be possible to begin the discussion. It has not been finalized. And they went around to neighborhoods and got community feedback. And I know a lot of folks were like, wait a minute, we don't want this. Why is the city doing this to us? Because honestly, I know that there are a lot of people who are used to the city coming to you with the idea, asking for your opinion and making no changes and implementing it anyway. And in this particular case, because we have to build 82,000 units and it's people say in eight years, we've already spent a year having discussions, making changes. But the fact is we need to do this within a certain time period, according to the state housing element. And what that means is we need to rezone the city where it makes sense. Now, does a 30 story uh, apartment building in Ocean Beach makes sense? No, it does not. It's ridiculous. But could there be a 10-story building in that same lot? Yes. So we need to look at our city and redesign it in such a way that it makes sense for the appropriate neighborhood. But more importantly, we need to get rid of all the obstruction so that when people it's in the books. It's, it's, it's on the books. It's the law. Why are we having a discussion? We should be able to do some of this over the counter in order to move forward and build housing faster, but not in, not, not something that's ridiculous in the neighborhood. And, and that tower that you're talking about is insane. You know, the other part is that it's a policy wise in regards to Prop C, for instance, in this last election about um, making it easier to convert downtown office space into other uses. The perception that a lot of voters get is, you know, Mayor Breed is really prioritizing policies that benefit the wealthy, the rich. Um, you know, we don't really see policies, um, you know, we didn't see you out in front promoting Prop A, and there was, we, we were unclear what the messaging was from your office, but we see you out there for Prop C. Well, okay, go ahead, <laughs> and, and, uh, if you can address that. Well, I co-authored Proposition A, and a, a supervisor took the lead on helping to um, get the ballot measure passed, but, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. You have cough drops also. <laughs> but let's be clear. The capital plan didn't even have a housing bond in the calendar of bonds. And when I became mayor, I put an option in our calendar for the capital plan, housing bonds, and have been very collaborative in working towards helping to get those not only on the ballot, but get them passed. So separately from that, you said that a lot of my policies promote the rich. And the fact is right now, let's be honest, 
where are we going to get all this money from to build some of this affordable housing that we so desperately need? It's not about a giveaway to the rich. It's about finding a balance and making sure that people want to do business in San Francisco, that they pay their fair share, but we don't overdo it so much that they choose some other place other than San Francisco to conduct business. And let's be clear, there are a lot of businesses who make a lot of money, and we know this. And they are, they make enough money to pay the taxes that we charge. But you know what? They're not choosing to stay here. And we have to find a balance. And for me, it's about attracting, retaining, and getting businesses interested in San Francisco and getting them interested in staying because they not only pay the taxes that help us with the programs that I know you care about, they also help us with the people that they employ and the opportunities that they provide. So it's really about striking a balance. And that's really what I'm focused on. I'm glad you brought up the capital planning process because our, our most recent um, activism dealt with the city clinic efforts. Um, from where we stood and we were doing advocacy efforts with it is, you know, the capital planning process, which is how bonds get introduced general obligation bonds as they expire, they get, you know, a new bond gets on the ballot. Um, so there's no tax increases. Um, and it's a multi-agency, multi-year process um, with the Capital Planning Committee. Um, if in February, City Clinic was in there. March, City Clinic was in there. And it seemed like there was this, um, or at least the perception is that it was a politicized decision. Here's the mayor running for re-election who decided to, you know, throw in something for the LGBTQ community for the Harvey Milk Plaza, of which the Milk Club has been a coalition member since the start. Cleve Jones is on the board of, of Harvey Milk Plaza. We love Harvey Milk Plaza, but we wouldn't, do, we wouldn't prioritize that before City Clinic, which is in a dilapidated 19, 20, 19 teens building. Um, and so we, you know, the, the reaction was, Great, the mayor is playing politics again. Jeffrey, I'm so glad that you asked about this. <laughs> and in the future, just pick up the phone and call me and ask. But, but here's the thing. That was my mistake in how I communicated because I took some things for granted. Number one, similar to, you guys know, the uh, Animal Care and Control Building. We didn't take that one to the ballot. We were able to use COP bonds, and we didn't have to take them to the ballot. And because City Clinic is in such a terrible state of repair, we have identified a building, and we're working on an alternative. We don't own the current facility. So we weren't, I didn't prioritize putting it in the bond because we were going to use another source to help pay for it and to get it done. And when we didn't, it didn't show up in the bond, and the activation happened and people went crazy and were like, wait a minute, you got to put this in the bond. You know, that was my mistake because then what happened is it put the Harvey Milk Plaza against the clinic and we had to, you know, course correct. And because we had additional bonding capacity in order to keep the peace, I just put it in a bond. But to be clear, it was going to get done and it was going to get done through a different process. What I prioritized in the bond had a lot to do with trying to get two thirds vote from the public because we ran into some problems with a previous bond in transportation where we could not get two thirds vote. And we wanted to make this a coalition building opportunity where the people that cared about these different projects were gonna fight for these projects and we were gonna be able to get it over the threshold. So it wasn't intentional to imply somehow that City College wasn't, I mean City College, City Clinic wasn't important and we weren't gonna take care of it. We were always gonna take care of it, just a different source of resources to do it. And now with the additional bonding capacity, it's on the bond, and my hope is that people will support it and fight for it. Great. And we've, and Milk Club has always supported renewal of those general, general obligation bonds. And we've been, it's been on our slate card. We look back for the last 10 years, you know, we've been mobilizing for them and we support our city departments. But one of the concerns that a lot of voters uh, have brought up, and the most uh, emails I get as I was preparing for this debate is, you know, you've been at the helm for five years now. We're at five years, am I right? Um, 
the the stories, the general perception of, and I know a lot of it predates you, whether it's corruption at DBI or you know we hear about DPW, um, you know, where does this end? Well, you know how. What will you actually, sh are you going to shake up the department heads if you're reelected? Um, how is this governance piece going to be handled? Well, thank you for asking the question. And I'll say a couple of things to just kind of unpack a lot of that. And the fact is, um, when I became mayor, it was under some challenging circumstances. I mean, we had lost our mayor. I was removed and I ended up winning the election. And then all of a sudden a pandemic hits and a once in a hundred years pandemic, and it required us to pivot and to address this crisis. And then we come out of this pandemic and there are all these different challenges around crime and safety and other issues. And we are starting to see change and see the city become a much better place to be in, including a safer place. And in the process over the years, there've been a number of very much uh, problematic, um, not only department heads, but also uh, organizations and other issues uh, within the city. And to be clear, like not one of those department heads that have been involved in any of those problems are people that I actually hire directly, number one. Uh, number two, I have consistently done everything I can uh, to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office and others in order to help impact change within our city and to make some uh, directives and other issues around responsibilities within the government. You don't have to just go through the Board of Supervisors to pass a policy. As mayor, I put out a number of directives and made a number of internal changes in order to make a difference in, in terms of how people felt they could or could not get away with things that they chose to do. Um, it's It's been an ongoing process and it's been a bit of a frustrating process, but ultimately, Many of the people who now work for the city as department heads are people that I had some role in hiring or selecting or participating in in some capacity. They all are very hard workers, and I know that there are people who may not always agree with some of the decisions that I or some of those department heads make, but ultimately I do everything I can to ensure full transparency to make sure that we are rooting out corruption and making sure that we are being transparent about how we're using public dollars and how we hold people accountable when they cross those lines. I've been very consistent in that, and I will continue to do everything I can to ensure that we're rooting out the problems that have existed in the past. And that's exactly what I think we've been doing. Great. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on a crime um, there's, again, I think one of the issues that we fight with you about is, um, the, cr the criminal justice reforms, you know, we, one, you fight with me, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the perception again is, you know, in the last few years, we've had Banco Brown, we've had Sean Moore, we've had all these cases where, you know, I understand you're, you are you, one of your big policy items is fully staffing the police supporting the police, standing with the police. But when there are bad apples, the when there are bad apples, we also, we want them to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to see another a case, a George Floyd happening in San Francisco. And we don't see that leadership from the mayor in calling for that, you know, be even handed. Yeah. Well, I, I disagree with that. And let me tell you, and you know, the fact is, um, when I was growing up in San Francisco, uh, gun violence was at an all-time high. And we didn't have the best relationships with the police department. And we worked really hard to improve upon them, those relationships in order to help save lives because of what was happening in my community. And over the years, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, um, at the time, Supervisor Cohen was a part of the Board of Supervisors, she led a lot of the reform efforts, and I supported many of those efforts that she led. In fact, she and I worked together to get the U.S. Department of Justice to come in with a number of reforms, which we finally were able to complete the 272 recommendations from the Obama administration, U.S. Department of Justice, for police reforms. We, we did that, and it took a lot of work with the community and people who were actually consistently at the table working with the police department, working with my administration to implement those reforms. There have been people 
who have rallied and, 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 and protested, but they weren't at the table when the real work was happening to do those reforms. But I was, and my office was, and our police department was, and some members of the community were. So I want to be clear about that first and foremost. The second thing is that, you know, a lot of what we need to address here, um, and, and I'll just say, you know, people are hollering defund the police and, and, and don't support the police department, but let something happen to you and the first thing you're doing is calling 911 and wondering why the police didn't get there in a timely manner. And I get it, you know, I get that people have issues and are concerns and it's not perfect, but I have worked really hard to build those bridges and in fact, especially with people in my community that I grew up in who are asking us to do more to help address the issues around crime in neighborhoods like the Tenderloin and neighborhoods like the Fillmore Western Edition. What I do with the department is try to make sure we not only implement these reforms and we focus on accountability, but we're also doing everything we can to make sure that this city is safe. And part of the safety includes officers, but it also includes alternatives to policing, which I've led on. So for example, people struggling with mental illness, it requires a different kind of response. And in the past, it was always a police response. We created the street crisis response team, which includes a clinician. It includes someone from the, um, fire department, a peer support, a people who are out there trying to diffuse situations, trying to work with people and trying to turn situations around. So it's not a one size fits all. It's not a just do this or just do that. It's all of the above and how we work together to make sure that we have a robust, transparent, a, a police department that is held accountable but is also doing the best they can to keep people safe, that we have alternatives to policing, that we are working hard on community policing and opportunities for us to build bridges and not just say we don't want something, but how is it that we're going to work together to ensure the safety of all of us in working with this department, and not to mention I'm responsible as the mayor for the entire city workforce, and that includes the police department. So I am going to do everything I can to support and uplift every city employee that's working for San Francisco in a respectful way. But also, as you said, when those mistakes happen or when things are done intentionally, that there is also accountability to address those issues. We have two questions um, from our board and our membership. At, um, Vince, if Vince can come on up, Vince, who was just honored by GAPA, the gay uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, Asian Pacific Alliance for all of his hard work on HIV AIDS prevention, uh, pa passing out those condoms, doing those hep C tests at every single corner, every single party I, uh, that's in the city. And let's give it up for Vince for all of his hard work. But Vince has a question. Also, um, District 5 um, resident, you were my supervisor. So, um, so I... My name is Vince. I am um, I'm a resident of District 5. I've been a person who's been living with HIV since 1987. And I've had an AIDS diagnosis since 1995. As you know, San Francisco has one of the best HIV um, care and prevention um, safety net in the world. That's one of the reasons why I'm alive today. And in this city, 74% of the people with HIV are elders, people over the age of 50. And so this year, however, you know, we went to City Hall. They said it's going to be a bad budget year. And yes, we agree, it is. Um, but we've pulled all of our organizations together, and we've decided that what we would like is that we would like to not destabilize the HIV safety net. And so you've always been very supportive. You come to all of our events. But this year we face we're facing nearly five hundred to eight hundred thousand in the CDC federal, CDC federal cuts. So could could you commit to funding or backfilling those federal cuts with city money? Well, and for, one more wow. thing, and what can be done for the organizations like Lyric who are losing? You know, because we got the services we need, but young people, queer trans folks, BIPOC folks, they need the services. And so what can be done to help them so that they aren't devastated? Yes. Well, thank you, Vince, for your question. And first of all, um, when I first became mayor, one of the things that I did was put an additional million dollars to help with housing stabilization 
to support those who are living with HIV AIDS in San Francisco when there was a deficiency in financial resources. And ever since I've been on the Board of Supervisors, I have consistently um, supported backfilling when the federal government has come in and made those cuts, uh, the Ryan White Act and the cuts that came in. I've been consistent in backfilling those lost resources, and my goal right now is to do so uh, as well in our current budget. Uh, we are still having uh, a lot of budget conversations, but um, my desire uh, in working with the community is to get to zero. Uh, San Francisco has really been a leader, and I don't want us to go backwards either. So my, my plan is to continue to do what I can to fund or uh, at least uh, fund the backfill of uh, the cuts that came from the federal government. And we are still having conversations about Lyric and the challenges there. Um, during the pandemic, no nonprofit organization, not only did they not receive cuts, but many nonprofit organizations received significant increases in revenue to assist with some of the challenges related to the pandemic. So we're analyzing um, the challenges with Lyric as we speak. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you uh, today, but we are definitely exploring the possibility because again, we definitely don't want to go backwards. So thank right. you. And all the HIV providers, we've all come together and this is what we agree has our minimum mass that we would all stand together for that to not destabilize the HIV safety net. So anything you could do, you helped me when I had housing problems. So anything you could do to do this would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's all. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to our mayor hey, for joining I'm us. I'm not finished yet. And I'll, I'll let you give our, our, our last, if you can uh, give us a pitch on uh, about our endorsement process and we invite you to join our endorsement process. Of oh, course. this, do I get a closing statement? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me today to have this important discussion. I know that, you know, in some political cases, we've not always seen eye to eye, but I'm very confident in the work that I've done to always be a supporter and true ally to the LGBTQ community in San Francisco. One of the first things I did when I became mayor is to dedicate $12 million so that we can finally build a museum in this city that represents the history and the culture of this community. And I've continued to make investments around safety related issues and working with the trans advisory committee, we've made transformative investments in trans home SF, ending trans homelessness, universal basic income, arts and culture, whatever it takes to invest in, support, and uplift this community. I have always been at the table as an ally to make sure that this city is fulfilling its promise to support this community. And so I think that my track record is solid in terms of what I've done and what I've done to try and work together. Um, politics aside, my hope is that we can continue to work together on the things that we agree on and the things that make us stronger as a community because we know outside of San Francisco there continues to be attacks on this community and this city has been steadfast in its work and its advocacy to invest in, support, and uplift and I will be unwavering in my commitment to support the LGBTQ community in San Francisco. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here and talk. No breaks. So we're, we're, we're getting to our uh, next um, participant. We have Supervisor Asha Safai. Let's give a warm welcome to Supervisor, Supervisor Safai. Come on up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please have a seat. So, so I think a lot of us would love to get an introduction to. Oh, please be seated. Please. I, I know. I know. There's a. We want to make it like a Oprah moment or or Mari or whichever whichever TV show you like to watch during the COVID uh, epi, uh, pandemic. I, I rewatched a lot of Jerry, but um. <laughs> in any case, you know, we. A, a lot of San Francisco voters are new to um, this race, and they're asking, you know, who's Supervisor Safai? So if you can 
introduce yourself to members of the Milk Club. Thanks. Thanks for having me here tonight. Really appreciate everyone coming out. Um, as you probably know, this is the first uh, real forum. Um, so I think it's a good turnout. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> Laughing. Uh, so anyway. Um, <laughs> but you were willing to be there. You That's were going right. to do a little tango. I, with I, I, was, it? I was ready, man. I'm ready to go anywhere, anytime, anyplace. Uh, so... I think that's how it should be. You should be able to come, answer the hard questions, whether it's a friendly crowd, whether it's a hostile crowd, no matter what, you got to show up. You got to show up for San Franciscans. It's too important right now. So uh, just so those of you that don't know about me again, my name is Asha Safai. Um, I'm an immigrant, a very proud immigrant to this country. I came when I was a small child, um, the only immigrant in this race uh, uh, that in t for mayor part of the major candidates. Um, I was born into a lot of what you're seeing uh, in the Middle East today, a lot of violence. Uh, some of my early memories were gunshots in the streets, um, upheaval, there was a revolution. Um, I had family members that were killed and we fled for our own safety. Um, my mom being American in particular, uh, it was no longer safe to be um, in Iran. So we came here when I was six um, and it, it tore my family apart. Um, I was raised by a single mom for some time. And one thing you know about those of you that are immigrants and those of you that are raised by single moms, you know how to fight for things. And you get out there every single day and you struggle. And I did that. I put my way uh, through school. I uh, went to Northeastern University, I studied political science and African-American studies. Um, had the great uh, honor of working in the Clinton White House uh, with Native Americans was my early introduction to Native American issues. And for those of you that were at City Hall last night for MMIW, Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women, San Francisco is number 10, number 10 in the country for Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women. So I had that early experience and exposure um, uh, right after I graduated school. Came back to Cambridge, worked for a civil rights math literacy organization called the Algebra Project, working with black and Latino students. Um, helping them be prepared to take algebra um, in our public schools. Then went on to MIT for city planning. Um, that's where I met my wife. Um, we got into a funny conversation about football, and we ended up getting married and ended up in her hometown, San Francisco. So I've started under Mayor Willie Brown, uh, worked for Mayor Gavin Newsom, and then had the great honor of working in the labor movement for almost a decade uh, with the janitors union and others and then was elected to the board in 2017. Thank you. Um, we already talked a lot about football tonight, so let's move on from that. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we hear from almost every single voter that we talk about is homelessness. The lack of shelter beds, of treatment beds, um, the number of families that are on the wait list have, have ballooned um, despite all the efforts of um, Mayor Breed, um, what is your solution? What is your plan? So uh, first and foremost, let me say, and I want to say this clearly, we are a city of phenomenal resources. I think a lot of you know that. We have a budget of $14.6 billion. So it's not necessarily a matter of resources. It's a matter of management, leadership, and accountability. 18 months ago, I ran a ballot measure called Proposition C, and the purpose of that was to bring mandatory audits to a department and oversight to the largest department in our city that did not have oversight. The mayor fought that, was not for it. But all members of the board, we, we got a coalition together, unanimously put it on the ballot. 68% of the voters voted for that and passed. And we then started the process of bringing that oversight to that department. A department in 2016 that started out at $100 million has grown today for over $700 million. One of the things we found out as we started to peel back the layers is we have empty shelter beds. We had, at the time, this time last year, 1,100 permanent supportive housing units unfilled. We have hundreds of affordable housing units in this city. So it's not necessarily about the resources. It's about the management, leadership, and oversight from the mayor's office. Despite the misinformation 
We are the strongest mayor system in the United States. This mayor has the power to hire and fire all department heads, appoint the majority of every commission, and importantly, right, Supervisor Avalos? Importantly, has the power to decide how money is spent. So last, this time last year, for example, Supervisor Peskin and I said, let's put 25 million aside to clean our streets because we needed additional resources. The mayor said, hmm, I kind of like that idea. I'm going to take 16 and spend it on that, but I'm going to take nine and spend it on my priorities. So family homelessness, as you talked about, that has skyrocketed. We have seen one of the largest increases. We proposed a resolution. We called the department to account and said, we cannot have children living on our streets. We have to provide vouchers. We have to provide additional resources and shelter, and we need to prioritize families. They can't be suffering on our streets. You brought up um, Supervisor Avalos, who's, who's in the audience, who you ran against. Many of us, uh, you That's know. That's my buddy now. <laughs> <laughs> um, which brings up, you know, a lot of folks have thought about you as, you know, if we were to rank progressives, you might be one of the folks that we would rank uh, in the race for mayor. Give us your best pitch to the progressives in this room of why, you know, you are a better choice. Well, I'll tell you right now, first of all, I represent the part of town where working families are. Everything that I've done, everything that I've been about has been struggling, fighting for and advancing issues for working families and immigrant families. As I said, the only immigrant in this race for mayor, strong voice for those issues. And I have been advocating on behalf of that. I know we're going to get into some issues that are important on behalf of the LGBT community um, and on behalf of all types of equity, all types of issues when it comes to um, those that need additional resources and support. Just last week, I'm sure you all read about it, uh, the mayor and her administration cut $24, $25 million from youth programming in our city. Okay? And then a couple days later, she announced she wanted to go out and raise $25 million for pandas. Okay? We put forward a resolution that said, kids, not pandas. We can do both, but I think kids are more important. So I've been fighting for children. I've been fighting for working families. I've been on the front lines um, for those issues consistently across the board. And by the way, I would be the first mayor in over 50 years to come from the labor movement. I worked shoulder to shoulder with janitors for almost a decade fighting for those issues and fighting for their concerns. Um, and I've carried that with me every day that I've been on the Board of Supervisors. There, there are some pretty radical proposals on the ballot that are circulating right now. Um, we have former Mayor Frank Jordan, um, who, whose image in that bathtub when he ran for re-election continues to be um, <laughs> shower. Was it a shower? Yeah. I remember, I remember watching it in that fuzzy public access TV <laughs> as a kid, and I was, I really, uh, he, Stu has a picture. But, you know, some of these proposals, such as eliminating district elections or having citywide elections, you can live in district, you can live in uh, any district, but you can vote for the district supervisor of Sunset. Um, some of the c charter reform measures, um, where, where do you stand on a lot of these measures that Daniel Lurie has, has kind of pushed out, uh, Quentin Kopp have pushed out um, in regards to restructuring the city government? Well, first of all, um, what I say to people when they say they want to eliminate commissions, I say, which one? Do you want to get rid of the Health Commission? Do you want to get rid of the Immigrant Rights Commission or the Human Rights Commission? Because those are the ones that aren't necessarily embedded in our charter that would be exposed and would be vulnerable under their proposal. And I don't support that at all. I think we need the oversight. We need the voice of our community. It's one of the things that makes San Francisco special. So I am absolutely opposed to the elimination of that. And by the way, it hasn't been done with community input and process. It's been done in the back room, backed by billionaires and their initiatives. That's not San Francisco. That's not the San Francisco way. We need to have it out in the light. Let's have a debate. Let's have a conversation. Let's have input on it. And then let's get to the right result. Now, could there be some consolidation? Maybe a few, but let's have a community process for that. Um, so I, I don't support that in any way. I am a strong believer. Obviously, I'm a district supervisor. I'm a strong believer in district elections, I think. And coming from 
the part of town that people felt was one of the most forgotten and overlooked and didn't get the resources that it deserved, you know, I think that that ends up being a really strong argument for district elections. So I'm 100% in favor of that. I think it's some, one of the ways in which we balance out some of that power that we talked about. Um, and just to add, can I just add one last thing? Sure. You talked about in terms of making the best case for progressive. There was a really regressive measure on the last ballot. There were a couple, but the one that I thought was one of the worst was Proposition E. It took away police accountability and oversight. It advanced high-speed chases, and it was going to target in very strong ways in allowing the police to really disproportionate um, uh, impact on black and Latino communities. I was the loudest voice against that. We campaigned hard. Unfortunately, we didn't have the resources, but in the end, it ended up being 46 no, 54 yes in a primary election. I think you put that on the November ballot, the result is flipped. And I think San Franciscans uh, really believe in more accountability oversight um, for all different types of law enforcement in our city. Um, we, Roberto, who's the executive director of the LGBT Historical Society, wants me to ask you whether <laughs> you will commit to our new LGBT history museum that we want to build here in San Francisco. Let's do it. All right. Absolutely. Heard, we, we have them on the record. Um, not, not, not only that, I mean, we, 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 we recently found out that there is a, a push to cut a lot of the HIV prevention work. Um, we got called by the BAR um, and I went on the record and said, you know, we can't take a step back on HIV prevention. We can't take a step back from supporting the work that and the work that we've advanced over the last 40 years when it comes to that. So we have to prioritize during the budget. And again, that's why I go back to kids, not pandas. You know, there's a lot more important things that are happening in our city right now. And a lot of that prevention and historical uh, preservation is a part of it. So you'll work with us and the AIDS Absolutely. Foundation making sure yeah. that we do the ad backs, especially during well, budget time. We will work together on during the ad back process. I don't even know if we're being honest with an $800 million deficit and growing if we will have ad backs, um, but we are absolutely committed to working with you to find a way to, to provide some support for sure. Great. We have, a, we have two questions from our, our board members. First, we have Sydney, who is uh, our co-chair of the Trans Caucus and who is a proud labor, labor union member um, and a proud nurse and Sydney. What's up? Hey. hey. Um, I know you. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was a good um, thing. Full disclosure. I know Asha. Um, but I know you because you show up. Um, you showed up for me and a lot of Milk Club members in the March elections. Um, and you show up for labor. So thank you for that. Um, my question is about City College. Um, City College is not meeting our mission to serve all the residents of San Francisco. In what ways will you support growing enrollment at City College to fulfill the mission? So I was going back to the work, and thank you, Sin, for that question. Um, going back to the work that we did with labor, we were on the front lines to fight for Free City College. Um, and unfortunately, it struck at the same time. There was a lot of uh, mismanagement in terms of leadership. So enrollment started to go down. Um, and so 100% committed to getting that back up. I think one of the reasons why we've lost our way at City College is because there's a state mandate that's coming down that wants us to turn into a two-year junior college model rather than traditionally what we've had in San Francisco, which is the community college model, which allows lifelong learning, which allows someone like my 83-year-old mother to go there and take classes and continue her education along with so many of the seniors aging in place in San Francisco, newly arrived immigrants to learn English as a second language and transition into our, in our, to our city and our economy. So we have to find ways to prioritize that and work together to, to grow the population. Some of it might mean looking at new revenue sources. Some of it might mean prioritizing some additional existing funds that we have, but we have to work with the uh, college board's uh, leadership, AFT 2121, to find the right way to get that uh, community college back on track. 
Thank you. And we have Gwen Craig, who's our former president, who has been instrumental in a lot of the good government reforms that we talked about, like district elections. Um, Gwen, I'm, if you can come up and ask a question. I think um, one of the things that brought about um, one of the um, changes the most in the political landscape of San Francisco was the redistricting process that we had the last time around. And it was a chaotic and destructive process that, re that returned the same sort of result. What do you think you could do, what you could um, participate in or lead in some way uh, to see that we don't have that same sort of process, that we can reform that process, that we can have something that has a, the ideal of community participation um, and uh, community appointment process, but doesn't steer us in the same, so that we reform what happened, that we don't have that happen again. Well, first of all, you shouldn't go to bed and then wake up the next morning and have the entire city change and the districts redrawn. They shouldn't be happening at two, three o'clock in the morning. That's not right. That's not real community input. That's not real community process. People go to move their car so it doesn't get towed at two in the morning. And then they come back and the entire city has been changed. I don't know. Raise your hand if you were in the room when they were drawing the lines. Three hands in the whole room. And this is a very active group of people. And I know you're active because I see a lot of you out and about in San Francisco. So the fact that that happened in that way is not a healthy and good outcome. I'm a, I'm a city planner. I'm an organizer by background and training. And if you want to have the voice of working people, immigrants, and all the cross section of San Francisco, you can't do it in the throes of night, first and foremost has to be really done. Second of all, there was supposed to be, there's supposed to be no political influence. There's supposed to be elected officials not making calls to their appointees and directing them what the outcome should be. And we found, right? And we found that people went on the record and said that that was happening and that was wrong. I sent out an email to my constituency. I had a meeting with my community leaders and said, this is your process. We can't get involved in any way, shape, or form. Not everyone's stuck to that. So I think first and foremost, you have to remove, uh, you have to reform maybe some of the appointment process to the people that are involved. You have to reform the community input process and the time of day that that happens to get true community input. I know that there are some initiatives right now that are coming and making their way to the Board of Supervisors to reform that process. Um, and I think, um, I think you're going to see some outcomes in November that will change that. And, and ensure that we have real community voice. Because, I mean, listen, let's be honest. When I first won, I won by 450 votes, 2016. Some of my colleagues won by 100 votes. You adjust the lines by a few blocks, that could change the outcome. And I think that was the intent of what was happening. And that's not really a fair representation. That's what, that, you know, that's gerrymandering, gerrymandering at its worst. Thank you for answering our questions. We, we want to wrap it up by um, giving you the opportunity, you know, as we're, and we invite you to participate in our endorsement process, which our PAC will be initiating this month. Um, but we, what is your compelling case for all of us? Um, you know, what will- Can I stand um, up now? Absolutely. What will <laughs> Mayor uh, Safai look like in terms of your administration if you're elected? So as I said, when I came in, I think uh, being someone that's coming from a working family, immigrant, uh, MIT background, someone that's fought every step of the way to ensure that all San Franciscans' voice are represented, uh, that's the San Francisco that I think we need to strive toward. Not a San Francisco f just for billionaires and millionaires and just extremely low income. We have to provide a space for all San Franciscans to live, thrive, and prosper in. And I have been dedicated to that my entire career, from the time I went to graduate school to working under Mayor Brown, Mayor Newsom, 
working on the streets of San Francisco and public works, putting formerly incarcerated, formerly homeless, and new uh, job seekers, job opportunities, cleaning and greening our streets, working as a deputy department head. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about um, the work with uh, the LGBT community, but my work began there doing true community development. I have been a voice for working families and those that can live, thrive, and strive in this city. And that is my goal. My goal is to have a San Francisco for everyone. And that hasn't been represented in a really long time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you, Su Supervisor Thank you for having. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you. All right. We can uh, welcome our next uh, panelist. We have Board of Supervisors President, Supervisor Aaron Peskin, come on up. Good evening, Jeffrey. So a lot of you may not know this, and um, but I was a uh, I've known Aaron since I was uh, 13. I was his first intern uh, in, in Board of Supervisors. And now I'm older than when you were first elected to the Board of Supervisors. So time really, uh, I'm getting old. It has been 24 years, Jeffrey. But, we actually uh, met on the campaign trail. He was supporting my opponent. Um, but we're not gonna make it easy for you tonight. Um, First off, I think a lot of us come into this room with the expectation that you are going to be the standard bearer for progressives. And we, uh, you know, we've seen you leading, we've seen you in politics for the last quarter century. What is it that you want to do if you're elected mayor of San Francisco? So let me start with this. Uh, tomorrow is Harvey Milk's birthday, and today is the 45th anniversary of the White Knight riots. And Harvey Milk and that experience, I think, profoundly changed San Francisco. Uh, it was an expression of the fact that San Francisco is a city where people could be who they wanted to be. It was a city of rebellion, a city of protest, a city of otherness. And after a third of a century of leadership that has not been progressive, I want to bring some of that back. I think a lot of the, your opponents alluded to this, but one of the main attacking points um, that they're going after you about is you know, they've called you the Terminator. Um, they've called you an obstructionist. Um, there's a lot of perception, um, especially in the yuppie crowd, you know, some of my best friends included, that, you know, you are this obstinate person that is opposed to housing. And that's, uh, and a lot of uh, my peers who are creating young families and want to stay in the city, they think, you're the number one opponent to them being able to uh, buy a house in San Francisco. So millions and millions of dollars have been spent by AstroTurf organization and a handful of plutocrats trying to spin that narrative. But the facts are the facts. The facts are in the 24 years that I've been in office, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan, the Rincon Hill Plan, the Shipyard, Candlestick Point, Park Merced, Rincon Hill, Western Soma, uh, Central Soma, uh, over 100,000 units of housing. And while other people are talking, I'm actually doing things, and I'm doing them in conjunction with the community. That is why, uh, through good work and collaboration, we were able to uh, figure out a plan to give us what has been missing. It's this conversation that Mayor Breed is going about upzoning, repeating the mistakes that we should have learned from, from redevelopment. The issue is financing and access to money, and we have actually introduced legislation 
where the city of San Francisco, and we've never done this before, can be the issuer of tax-exempt revenue bonds to build housing for middle-class people. That's what this is really about, which is these are people who have not been able to afford to live in San Francisco, and San Francisco needs a plan to help them. Um, and it's not going to be $2,000 a square foot house luxury towers on the waterfront. That's not what any of these people can afford, but those AstroTurf billionaires have made them think that. We're going to let, let me follow up. So the, the next line of attack is, you know, I, I was reading Marina Times to prepare for this. Um, but, you know, you rattled off that list of neighborhoods, right? And none of them are, in, you know, the attack line is none of them are in District 3. You know, you're not building in North Beach. You know, there was that little kerfuffle last year about, you know, you trying to protect that block. Um, in, 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 in around Telegraph Hill, North Beach. Um, and those are the stories that are amplified now uh, in, in our news, news cycle. Um, you're not, you're a NIMBY. So let me just say that number one, affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. When God gave us that gift of the, except for the 53 people who died, the Loma Prieta earthquake and our Agnos made the decision to tear down the Embarcadero freeway and reunite us with that waterfront. We received a bunch of former on-ramps and off-ramps that we got from the state of California. And originally, Willie Brown was mayor at the time. One of them was going to be a hotel, and one of them was going to be a police station, and one of them was going to be affordable housing. All of those sites are now hundreds and hundreds of units of permanent, permanent low-income, affordable housing. That's what I've done in District 3. And there are more opportunities. I've been trying to get the Kirkland Bus Yard, which is a great site. But remember, District 3 has Chinatown. It's got rent-controlled apartments that are full of our artists and our musicians and our poets and our writers. And we don't want to demolish and evict those people. And that's what I fight for, not only in the northeast corner of the city, but throughout the city. I mean, fundamental, fundamentally, Jeffrey, I think that we are smart enough that we can grow San Francisco without destroying our neighborhoods. I think we're smart enough to do that. There's this narrative that, you know, because you've been at the helm for a quarter of a century, and I think, you know, both Daniel Lurie, you know, mentioned, you know, he's outside of government, he's coming in, he's an outsider. Um, London Breed highlights the fact that, you know, you're the veto actor in blocking her reforms. You know, where is the truth in, uh, in these uh, arguments? Well, look, uh, without casting aspersions on the other candidates in this race, let's talk about money. Uh, Proposition C, which is actually the biggest source of funding for homelessness, that actually was opposed by Mayor Breed. That's the reality. Proposition I, another uh, tax that Mayor Breed opposed because it was taxing some of the richest people in San Francisco, uh, that is something that I supported. To answer your question, you've got to really stick up for what you believe in, and you've got to be able to call balls and strikes and let that land wherever it lands, and, and that's what I've done. And by the way, for uh, remember this, Mr. Lurie, it takes a long time to figure out how this government works and it's not all going to be solved with philanthropy. And real democracy is people pay their taxes, and then we collectively, as the government, with real input, decide how that money is going to be spent. It's not just all going to be fixed by your billionaire friends. Da Daniel Lurie, I was listening to one interview that he gave. He, he, he was asked about you, and his line was, he's very smart, uh, and the thing is that he knows where the bodies are buried. What, do you, what does he mean by that? I, you'd ha I, if he's still here, you can ask him. I don't know. I, I, look, I will say this, which is, and perhaps this is not a progressive or moderate issue, um, but I have worked to root out corruption and nepotism in San Francisco government. So if that's what he is referring to, uh, I have a track record of having gone after that. Uh, I'm the only person in this race who has proposed having an inspector general. I introduced that legislation today. It is a change to our charter. That is a national gold standard model. Um, so maybe maybe that's what he's referring to. I think a lot of, especially gay men in this room, have um, 
struggled with, and I know you've had a very public um, struggle with it, and that's alcoholism. Um, we, um, we read about it in the news, and I think that's another um, storyline that gets presented a lot. Um, tell us about that journey. Well, uh, I learned a lot, um, and recovery is not a one-and-done thing. It's something that you do all the time, and um, I'm remarkably grateful. Uh, I wake up much more grateful every day than I used to, and I learned that it's not something that you do alone. As a matter of fact, I realized that um, I'm part of a community and a community that cares, and that taught me a lot. Um, and I think people who have gone through recovery – uh, know that, and they know how precious things are, and they also know that they're part of a of a really loving community. And I, frankly, probably wouldn't be here running for mayor today had um, I not gone through through that experience. Tell, tell me about your your uh, work with the LGBTQ community, because um, I know you were one of the first to appoint a trans uh, commissioner in the city and county of San Francisco. Um, tell us about your record on LGBTQIA issues? Well, let, let me start with thanking the Harvey Milk Democratic Club for endorsing me every single time that I have run for office. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, Tom Amiano did a heroic write-in effort, and that was the first campaign in San Francisco uh, that I got involved in, um, and it was life-changing and inspirational. Um, and then uh, I guess that inspired Tom to ask me to run the next year. I didn't have any idea of what that entailed, but I won, and there went the next eight years, uh, four of which I had was elected unanimously by my colleagues to be uh, the president of the boards. And the way it worked back then, Jeffrey, was uh, the Milk Club was kind of my direct community. So that's how Gabriel Holland became a commissioner. Gabriel had a background in the law, and that was a perfect fit for the Board of Appeals. And on on it went. Um, and, uh, and that also was why when Ryan White care dollars were being cut back by the United States government, um, we knew that we had to backfill those dollars come hell or high water. And that was why when uh, Trans Home wanted to locate in District 3, we were there at the beginning and why uh, we welcomed Trans Thrive down in, on Bush Street. Um, it's just how I was raised. We here, sorry. No, I was just going to also say this, which is so many of the right on policies emanated from this community. Uh, the early work on domestic partner benefits that became ultimately same-sex marriage that started in San Francisco uh, under then Gavin Newsom and spread to California and spread across the nation. Our early laws on inclusionary and holding developers accountable to pay their fair share, a lot of that emanated from the LGBTQ community. I think a year or two ago, we had Joe uh, Eskenazi come in and talk about corruption in City Hall. And he was saying that, you know, it's a well-known fact that in DBI, there is an Irish gang, there is a Chinese gang, and in all these various departments, there is this deep-rooted corruption that often comes down to neighborhood and ethnic lines. Um, you know, as, as San Franciscans, we're just sick and tired of all of that. We're, uh, how will it look differently under your administration? The tone from the top has got to change. And the tone, depending on what mayor you want to pick over the last 25 years, has either been openly encouraging of nepotism and pay to play and insider trading, or the current administration where there has been deafening silence. Now, I'll say that Mayor Breed has not gotten in the way of any of these investigations, but there has not been a very clear tone from the top that this kind of behavior will not be tolerated, that it will be rooted out. That, that tone does not exist. That tone would definitely exist under a Peskin administration. One of the... One of the things that Mark Leno recounts when uh, we were talking is that 
when you were both sitting on the finance or budget committee, you were able to, you know, just call out the numbers and really had a firm grasp on departmental budgets. And that, that bit seems to be lacking in a lot of the way the city is run right now, especially we were talking about the general obligation bond fiasco with city clinic and, you know, doing the math over millions of dollars. Um, how do you approach po public policy? Um, and what is, what, what kind of public policy perspective are you going to bring? So Jeffrey, first, let me start by thanking the milk club, but particularly your president, uh, for coming to the capital planning and committee and insisting that city clinic be put back into the bond. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Um, it, ma it made my job easier. Uh, I think the real answer to your question is this job is hard work. I mean, it's not, it's not fun. It's not sexy. It's not about making speeches. It's about staying up until two o'clock in the morning and reading everything and being surrounded by smart people who have a high level of care, who are interested in the details. That is actually what being a chief executive is about. It's about bringing people together. It's about bringing different providers and different agencies together that right now have no mature leadership that are bringing them to bringing them together. But bottom line is it's hard work. And I, I'm glad that Mark held me in high esteem. We challenged each other and he's a mensch and he worked hard and I worked hard and, you know, we figured it out. We have a couple of questions from uh, our, our members, but first off, we have Vince, who I know you saw at GAPA on Saturday, receiving an award for his work uh, at the SFA Foundation. Let's give another round of applause for Vince. But Vince is going to ask a question. Great speech by Congressman Takano, too. I mean, it's not the same question I asked previously. Um, this one, um, you know, San Francisco is facing an unprecedented um, overdose crisis with hundreds of people dying every year. And one of the things that has been proven, um, safer, safer consumption sites, overdose prevention sites, are a proven public health intervention that have existed for over 30 years across the world, including most recently in New York and unofficially in San Francisco. Um, they also exist in other forms like bars, our supervised consumption sites, and they've been around forever. Um, but what would you do um, to, um, you know, I talked earlier about the care that has kept me alive. And now in my work with elders and people aging, people with substance use issues often just are looked at as almost being disposable. And they are being demonized by the current city, um, by, by a lot of the residents. So what would you do to um, make sure that these, this is remedied? So Vince, let me start out by saying that um, I was one of 11 supervisors who voted for the declaration of an emergency in the Tenderloin but was quite disappointed when 10 months later, the mayor reversed course and closed down what we spent a lot of money standing up. And that was uh, the uh, facility at United Nations Plaza um, that actually saved a lot of lives. And when we closed it, you saw a spike in deaths. Um, I have been for uh, supervised consumption sites, safe injection sites. Uh, in the old days, uh, that was, um, we, we used to have to declare an emergency every two weeks for our needle exchange, but that saved lives. Treatment, treatment, we've got to stand up more treatment. And I think if San Francisco coordinates its departments, HSH and DPH, fundamentally, this is a public health crisis, uh, but you've got to have a plan and stick to that plan. You can't zigzag and change your mind uh, because you're getting pressure. And I think we have to be brave. And New York figured out a way to do it. I think San Francisco can figure out a way to do it. We did it in the 90s with needle exchange. And um, yeah, so just, you know, I am also on the long-term care council. And I think we need to look at supervised consumption sites and overdose prevention sites has a component of long-term care because otherwise our folks will not age and there will not be any long-term survivors of the future. Yeah, and also for people who think that recovery happens in 30 days, it doesn't. Your brain doesn't change that fast. It's got to be a longer-term investment. Thank you. Thank you. We have a second question from Sydney. 
um, who's our co-chair of the Trans Caucus. Sydney is our proud um, nurse. We need to trot out Sydney. Sydney has beautiful child, beautiful family, a nurse, union member. Um, and Sydney's asking our next question. I'm not running for office. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw that um, our bill, CalCare, the California Nurses Association bill, uh, CalCare was recently killed um, in the Appropriations Committee. Um, from where I'm sitting, living in this city, seeing people on the street, without universal health care, we, it, it feels doomed here. Um, but I also think this city is capable of things no other place is. So my question is essentially, how do you think we can improve healthcare and mental health services in the city for our homeless population for sure, specifically our trans population? Um, I'd just love to hear from you about it. Thanks. So a number of answers. Um, number one, uh, San Francisco has been at the forefront. And this is another place that we led. We led with Healthy SF before, before there was Obamacare. And uh, we've always been ahead of our time. Uh, and by the way, I salute the mayor. And I think everybody on the board uh, and the mayor agree that we can solve trans homelessness. That is actually in reach. Um, but bottom line is, we have to invest. All of this costs money. I am actually hopeful about the passage of Proposition 1A and what it means for San Francisco. I think that there is so much better coordination that we can do with our shadow city workforce, an array of nonprofit, incredible service providers who are demonized by the right all of the time, but they need help. And actually the city who has, and Michael Pappas and I were having this conversation last week, has DPH and HSH and DCYF and numerous contracts, we can make it easier and optimize with service providers, not only in the area of trans health, but in the area of, uh, FCU, of substance abuse disorder, a whole number of places. We can be so much more efficient with the dollars that we have if we would listen to the community and we would listen to those nonprofit providers rather than demonize them. I want to ask one last question and then ask you to give your uh, final thoughts. But one, one area that a lot of us are wondering about is policing, about safety. Um, and especially since um, I, I know you've kind of drawn a pragmatic approach um, in regards to policing. Um, what is your plan for keeping San Francisco safe? So, Jeffrey, I think we all see the world from where we live it. And I have to say, in the northeast corner of San Francisco, uh, where you grew up, um, where the good people of Chinatown insisted on having actual community policing with beat officers who came from the community, who are bilingual, who know the names of their shopkeepers and their grandmamas and grandpapas, that... It, promise of community policing really needs to be spread all over San Francisco. I've got it um, in the northeast corner of the city, but the rest of the city largely does not. Um, and we must not retreat from the sensible reforms that we have been undertaking. And let's be clear, the Right-wing oligarchs who are trying to run this town have a measure on the ballot that not only gets rid of the Public Health Commission, the Immigrant Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Library Commission, but takes away civilian oversight, which is commonplace in municipalities all over America. We need to fight back. Uh, and to that end, today I introduced a charter amendment uh, that will fight back. Uh, and we cannot let together SF... Uh, and a handful of billionaires do this in a dark back room. With that, I'm going to let you give your summary of why. And we invite you, of course, to join our endorsement process, which we're starting this month. Um, but give us your pitch. I would be honored to have the Harvey Milk Democratic Club's endorsement. I appreciate the five endorsements that you have given me when I have run for supervisor and the four times I ran for the Democratic County Central Committee. This would be my 10th time. Uh, 
virtually, I, I think all of my major opponents in this race are supported by at least one billionaire, if not more. Uh, we talked about the heroic efforts of Tom Amiano 25 years ago, of Matt Gonzalez four years after that, uh, of Mark Leno and Jane Kim, who got very close uh, a bunch of years ago. We can win this thing. I need you to help me win this. I need you to volunteer. This is our chance. I need small donations. I need you to come to our campaign headquarters at 2055 Market Street in the Castro at church. And I need you to go online to Aaron2024.com and get involved so we can win the heart and soul of our city back. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we have one last candidate um, that's joining us. Um, let's have a little stretch. Let's, you know, I know people are uh, sedentary, um, but let's welcome um, our former mayor and former supervisor, Mark Farrell. Come on up, Mark. Mark is tall, so how are you? Nice to meet you. Please, please be seated. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And I, I know we may not agree on a lot of issues, but you know, if London's here, Mark is here, and you know, we're, we're excited to have you. Well, thank you, I'm excited to be here. Um, tell us about your, your experience with the Milk Club or you know, your past interactions with us while you're here. I appreciate it. First of all, thank you for hosting. Thank you all for having me here this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I thought I'd start off by just sharing three thoughts with you um, to, begin a, to begin our discussion together um, that I, I think is really important to get across here. First of all, to know that I am a native San Franciscan and very fortunate uh, to, be a, to have been born and raised here. And what that means to me more than anything is that I grew up in the city of San Francisco where all of my friends were of different races, ethnicities, religions, ultimately sexual orientations as well. Um, and to me, that was simply part of growing up here in San Francisco. And to me, it was what I believe is the most unique about our city. It took me moving away to college to really understand that um, about what makes us unique here in San Francisco. And as part of that, you know, I believe because of growing up here in San Francisco, that our LGBTQ plus community is simply part of the fabric of our city. Um, it's how I was raised, and after leaving for about 10 years to go to school and grad school, I came back to San Francisco because this is the community I wanted to be part of. Um, so I am a proud, proud born and raised San Franciscan uh, here in our city. Second of all, I sit here, actually sit here today, we're not standing, uh, very much as a straight, white, cisgender male, um, but also an unapologetic supporter of our queer community here in San Francisco with a track record to back that up as well. When I was in office before, first of all, a supervisor, so always supported then Supervisor Wiener and Supervisor Campos's efforts to backfill all of our HIV and AIDS funding uh, inside of City Hall. I did it when I was budget chair as well for four years and I will do it again as mayor. You have my unequivocal commitment to do that. Second of all, I worked on legislation throughout my time in office in support of our queer community here in San Francisco. Number one, after a conversation with um, a fellow city government employee when I was in office before, I realized that same-sex couples here in San Francisco that work for the city of San Francisco um, could get health benefits and partner health benefits. However, those partners were taxed on a federal level for those health benefits. And to me, that was not what San Francisco is all about. So I authored legislation with the support, for sure, unequivocal support of my colleagues and then Mayor Lee to reimburse same-sex couples for any of these federal tax, um, not benefits, but tax dollars that they were having to spend. And I think that was really important for me to do that, um, very much something that was supported, obviously, in a big way within our LGBTQ plus community here in San Francisco. 
was very proud to co-author legislation with then Supervisor Campos around making all of our single stall bathrooms and businesses and public buildings throughout the city of San Francisco gender neutral. I thought that was very important to do and I supported that and co-sponsored that with him. And then when I was mayor, I had the opportunity to sign a number of pieces of legislation into law um, that were really a big part of our queer community here in San Francisco. The legislation that allowed Terminal 1 to become Harvey Milk, Milk Terminal, excuse me, on the eve of his birthday. I'm mindful of that as we sit here We're today. ready to rename the entire airport after Harvey Milk, too. Um, and then, sorry, just it, it, let, me, let me conclude by also saying um, that I would say one of the most memorable days in my time in office inside of City Hall was on June 26, 2015, when the U.S. Supreme Court came down with their Obergefell versus Hodges decision. And being inside the mayor's actually back chambers then with Mayor Lee and celebrating with so many members of our queer community here in San Francisco. To me, that was critically important, um, but also something that I celebrated and sticks with me in my mind today that I share with everyone. And then lastly, to say that I don't believe the fight for equality is over in San Francisco. You know, I've talked to so many friends of mine in the queer community that are truly gutturally afraid of what's happened at the U.S. Supreme Court. I guess the implications of allowing Republicans to take control of the White House. It's the implications and why we need to fight, in my view, for, some, for President Biden going forward in this election here in 2024 so hard. Um, but I also believe we need to continue to expand that into our trans community, into our community of colors um, here in San Francisco. And for me, um, I believe that's what the mayor should do here in San Francisco. And I acknowledge that I'm lucky enough to be from here. We are raising our children here. But I also acknowledge that in many ways, the San Francisco community is a chosen family for many others. And I believe it's the mayor's obligation to make sure that our city is safe, affordable, and welcoming. And as mayor, I will do that. So thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Um, I get all these ads for family plans. You know, who, who, who are your top five most dialed people? And in your inner circle, who's LGBTQ? And what role do they play in advising you? So I have friends of mine um, from growing up here in San Francisco that are part of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, members of my staff from my campaign team. So, you know, as I do with everybody, I take everybody's input. Um, and as I think about policies, I think about being in elected office once again, um, and I will continue to do so. And in your, in your inner circle, in your top 10 most dialed people, who are some of these people that, you know, you will turn to you know, for advice on major decisions that you would make as mayor? Uh, within the LGBTQ plus community in particular? It doesn't need to be. Who are, your, who are some of these people in your top 10 inner kitchen cabinet? Ah, sure enough. Well, first of all, my family. Um, look, I am to know me is to know that I'm a father first. My wife and I are blessed to be raising three children here in San Francisco. Um, and my greatest joy in life is being a father without a doubt. So it is my family. Um, I'm also blessed to have so many friends from my childhood here in San Francisco, friends that I went to kindergarten with that are still very good friends of mine and dear friends of mine today. Um, so those are the people that I rely on. Obviously, when it comes to policy and so forth, there's a much broader aperture um, that we rely on here in San Francisco. Um, but I'm very blessed to have a core family and core friends that I rely on for support every step of the way. I, I know you went to SI. Is that right? Um, I went to Lowell. I'm a SF native. You're, also. you're a smart kid. Um, but, you know, the reality is what we are seeing is uh, that in our public schools, especially, there is resegregation happening. You know, we have a th maybe a third of our under 18 population is Chinese, a third that's white. But in our public schools, it's now down to less than 10 percent. So m my nieces and nephews are not growing up with your kids in the same classrooms. Um, this income and part of that is race, part of it is income inequality, part of it is neighborhoods. But we want a mayor that unites us. You know, what would that look like uh, in your administration? No, I appreciate that question. And to be sure, you know, we are a Catholic family and are we, we're, we are raising our children in Catholic schools. Um, by the way, I think part of the beauty of being in San Francisco, my Catholic parish is incredibly welcoming of every community here in San Francisco, in particular our queer community. That's what I love about San Francisco. Even within our Catholic church, we find that community. But to me, you asked specifically about schools. 
I want to be the first mayor that actually proactively works in support of our public school families and public school children in ways that have never been done before here in San Francisco. I mean, let's acknowledge that because it's a separately elected body with the SFUSD school board that dictates policy and dictates the budget of our school board, that City Hall has traditionally been very divorced from our public school system. I want to be a mayor that changes that paradigm, and I'm going to list three ways to you. First of all, one of the three core pillars of our public school system here in San Francisco is around third grade reading proficiency. One of the key markers of academic success in grammar school and in high school and then beyond. So important that a California Bureau of Prisons uses it to plan future prison beds in the state of California. So important that we focus on that one issue. We have a Department of Early Childhood in San Francisco inside of City Hall that allocates tens of millions of dollars a year to youth programs, but we've never had mission alignment with our public schools. And so as mayor, I will make it the first priority of funding out of that department to support third grade reading proficiency within our public school families. I believe it's critically important. It's never been done before out of City Hall, and I can't displace the policy and budget authority of our public school board, but I can certainly support our families and our children. Second of all, within our MTA, we have never had aggressive, proactive engagement between our MTA and our public school system. I cannot tell you how many public school families I talk to in particular, where they actually struggle to get their kids out of the house in the morning. By the way, we all do as parents, that, that's universal. But they get them to the bus stop in the morning only to see a full bus drive by. And now that child is late to school. There's stigma attached with that. And oh, by the way, truancy post COVID has been a really major deal um, across schools, but certainly our public schools and the data shows that here in San Francisco. So I will be a mayor that actually asks our and mandates that our MTA coordinate with our public school system, not only on bus frequency, but bus routes as well. And oh, by the way, we've had free meaning for youth as a pilot program for over 10 years. Let's cut to the chase and just make that permanent here in San Francisco. There, there's one point, you know, I want to get a little bit philosophical here. Um, one thing I actually share with you is, you know, I'm a Catholic also. I was a Catholic school principal here in San Francisco. Um, what school? Uh, St. Mary's it has since closed. But one of the things that I struggle with you um, and listening to your policy statements in the press is, you know, I, I like to joke that Pope Francis turned me into a socialist. Um, <laughs> But that, but those, you know, those teachings of, you know, social justice, helping the poor, you know, making sure that there is a preferential priority, preferential treatment of the poor. I don't get that. And, you know, you're the one candidate that I, I listen to and I read in the news. And it seems that you are, your, your policies are the mo most opposite of what the church is teaching about helping the poor um, and about economic justice and really improving those inequities that we see here in the city. I want to start a oh, conversation man, I, about that. Well, I appreciate that comment as a fellow Catholic. I couldn't disagree with you more about where I, where I believe my policies lie. First of all, as I talk about core issues around public safety, that affects people of every income in San Francisco. And public safety all of a sudden has become the number one concern across our city. It's affecting residents in wealthy neighborhoods. It's affecting residents in the Tenderloin, um, perhaps even more so. And I believe focusing on public safety is focusing on safety for every San Franciscan. To me, public safety, as we're sitting here tonight, is queer safety. And I talk to so many people within our LGBTQ plus community in San Francisco that feel vulnerable, certainly within our trans communities in particular. And so I don't believe that that is antithetical. Um, to income inequality or, or, or anything else that you're discussing right there. Um, and to me, as mayor, as I was before in office, as a supervisor and as mayor, I believe it's important to be a mayor for all San Franciscans. Um, and I will do exactly that. I'm happy to talk through any single policies you might have. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, we have a lot of proposals that are floating around um, dealing with changing fundamentally the way the city does its taxation, that does gross receipts tax. Um, and there's already a dividing line between, uh, especially in the last ballot cycle on Prop C, about giving tax breaks, um, from our perspective, and give a, giving tax breaks to real estate, um, large landlords, and making it easier for them to do conversions. Um, 
you know, you've stood on the other side. Um, what policies will you put in place that will actually benefit the working class and making sure that we can stay in the city, that it becomes more affordable for folks that are working nine to five, working three, four minimum wage jobs? I appreciate that question. Um, let's talk specifically then housing because I am unapologetically pro-housing here in San Francisco. My track record is as a supervisor in District 2 um, of building housing, infill lots throughout the district when I was a supervisor, kickstarting processes around 3700 California, which is the old CPMC site, and 373800 California, around the 3333 Laurel Heights, uh, California building, which is the Laurel Heights UCSF campus around Lucky Penny. These are all in the neighborhoods that I live in. Um, we are building more housing in the north side because of projects that I worked on. Um, and again, those other bigger projects, current supervisor Stephanie is the one who's been carrying them across the goal line legislatively, and she deserves credit for that. But we worked on those. Um, and I believe that we need to build more housing here in San Francisco to make our city more affordable, plain and simple. Um, I believe it encompasses three areas in particular. Number one, it encompasses zoning. Number two, it encompasses legislation. And number three, it encompasses mayoral directives to make sure that our planning and DBI departments are actually more efficient. You know, when you submit a permit into the planning department and they tell you it could be two months and it could be two years, that's holistically inappropriate. It's bad for residents that are looking to do work on their homes, but it's bad for commercial developers that are looking to build more units here in San Francisco to hopefully make our city more affordable. Um, in my view, I believe we need to be incredibly pro-housing here in San Francisco. I don't believe every neighborhood should look the same. I believe that the greatest capacity for additional units is in the financial district, is in South of Market, is in Mission Bay. But I believe we also need to build along transit corridors. We need to build in every single neighborhood. And I believe that is the single biggest driver that we can do inside of City Hall as you think about affordability um, here in San Francisco. And one of the issues that we, um, one of our former club presidents, Paul Mebostay, who was a member of the Ethics Commission, um, has really gotten us to pay attention to is you know campaign finance um you know we we know that you have gotten a lot of money from various uh, of these new groups that have come up in the city together sf grow sf and i you know what what troubles me is you know I, i've shared previously that i teach government social studies i you know i don't teach kids that you know money is how you impact public policy in the city Money is not what, you know, that's not the lesson that I'm teaching the kids, but the well-funded folks, and you included Daniel Lurie, um, you know, there's this perception that you're buying your way into office. And one of the things that a lot of political scientists say is that, you know, one of the most predictive factors in what an elected candidate does in the future is the money and where it comes from and what interests that they will represent. Um, what, what will you tell my, you know, my students that are you know, learning about this process and seeing where the money is flowing from? Sure, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I would A, challenge, we're not getting money from any groups here. These are individuals that have contributed to our campaign and very thankful for the individuals and the contributions that they've made. Um, Every other candidate is out there raising money, as is Supervisor Peskin, Safai, Daniel Lurie, Mayor Breed. Everyone's raising this money. Um, and some are having better success than others, and so be it. That's politics. Um, but I want to be very clear about the record about who's contributing and what. These are, these are contributions to the campaign themselves, not from other organizations. Um, but in terms of your core question about what you're teaching your kids, and I love you asking that question. So our children, just so you know, we have a senior in high school who's graduating on Saturday. Um, and I'm a soft from SI, um, and you know, I'm again, I'm a dad first. So if I tear up, forgive me on that one. Um, but we're so incredibly proud of our daughter and we have two sons, one who's a sophomore, one who's a fifth grader. And you know what the easy part in this election would have been last year when people were starting to approach me, Hey, you should run for mayor. And I said, no. And I said, you know what? I'm happy to write a $500 contribution check to a candidate that we could all support. And that was going to be my contribution, how I was going to be involved. And you know what we talk about as a family? We talked about our Jesuit education as a family and the education that our children are receiving. And the core tenet of that education 
is to be men and women for others. So I could have easily sat back and just written a contribution like everybody else is doing and not engaged. But you know what we're teaching our children is that when there is an issue in front of you, you actually step up and engage in your community. I actually believe that by running by mayor, I'm a setting example for my children and for my family and living up to the Jesuit values of being men and women for others. You know, last in 2010, you know, that there was a $191,000 ethics violation that was filed um, against her campaign about um, illegal independent ex expenditures. And I think that was from neighbors and together SF, they were involved with a lot of the independent expenditures this time around. Um, you know, a lot of San Franciscans are kind of sick of this kind of money in politics, greed, corruption cycle. Um, where, where, where are we with that in this election cycle? Where again, we're hearing a lot of the same stories. Specifically, what's the question here? Specifically in regards to independent expenditures that are coming in um, from neighbors, from Together SF, um, many of them supporting you. So to be sure, first of all, since I left City Hall and now I'm coming back um, into the political arena, the landscape has shifted. There's been groups that have been formed like the ones you're alluding to. Um, I'm unaware of any independent expenditures that have been formed or are being formed. Um, these are all organizations that every single candidate, I am sure, that is up on the stage is courting. Um, and they have independent boards, and I hope to earn their support as I hope to earn the support of organizations throughout the city of San Francisco. Um, quite frankly, I've heard of independent expenditure campaigns being formed in support of other candidates that were just up on stage here um, with you. So, you know, to me, um, that's not something that I'm aware of. Anybody that's supporting me right now, if it happens, it happens. It won't be something that I'm aware of. Um, but again, to me, this is, this is not something that would be unique uh, to a Mark Farrell campaign. Um, but right now, it's nothing that I'm aware of. Um, and again, I am seeking the support of organizations across the city of San Francisco, um, as are these other candidates out here in front of us. We're going to have Gwen Craig, who is our phenomenal trailblazer. I'm gonna, Gwen is going to ask a question. Uh, Gwen, come on up. Let's give it up for Gwen Craig. Um, I would like to ask you a separate question, but I'd just like to just comment that uh, we all read the newspapers and we all know about the crossover in staffing between your campaign and uh, particularly Kanishka Chang and Together SF and um, Kanishka Chang and Together SF. So, I mean, to you, you sort of you know, plead ignorance about these things, but we read the newspapers <laughs> and we know that you're aware of the disclosures about the personnel crossovers between your campaign and Together SF. So we have a real reason to, to be concerned about your reliance upon the resources of Together SF. And we know that Together SF is intent on changing the political landscape of San Francisco and moving us to the right, uh, moving us from the progressive vision that Harvey Milk and so many others fought for, that he was elected to the board as in a way to change and maintain the political vision that we all, many of us came here to be a part of and worked so long to be a part of and that uh, you seem to be allied with the folks who want to, to change that and realign that vision. Some of them have uh, appeared on Fox News, and Fox News seems to be very happy about this political realignment they see happening in San Francisco. And, you know, we're very concerned that you seem to be a part of that. And the campaign that seems to be most aligned with Together SF is the Mark Farrell campaign. So uh, we are concerned about that. My question to you is, they're involved in a lot of processes to reform the charter, uh, reduce the size and number of commissions. They want to do away with district elections. Uh, in your alignment with Together SF, 
where are you on those issues? Where is your position on tenants' rights and the other things that they want to change about San Francisco? Um, so first of all, thank you for your question, and I appreciate your commentary. Um, you asked me, I think, a few different questions. I'll address the one around charter reform, because I do think it's important for the future of San Francisco. Um, I understood that uh, you know, that was being filed. I read the text of it. Um, I know there are groups collecting signatures for that right now. And I'm a very big early supporter of charter reform um, that's before us right now. You know, I believe that we have, with the over 130 commissions that we have inside of City Hall, I believe it's too many. Which ones will you eliminate? Well, there are half of them that are going to get eliminated. Um, and I agree with the text of it and that there'll be a body that will exist you know, after these 40 core commissions to, to understand or to evaluate which the last 25 will be. Um, but right now, to me, we have way too many commissions inside of City Hall. I think most importantly, though, you know, we have these, these the appointing authorities um, and the terms of these commissioners right now, to me, it's very undemocratic, right? And the honest answer is you appoint somebody to a commission for a four-year term and they are there absent fraud or anything else that they, let's just say they're going to jail for, they are there for that term, unaccountable to their appointing authority, unaccountable to the voters of San Francisco. I don't believe that's right. Um, and yes, I was in City Hall while this structure existed. It took a few recent appointments and some, some hiccups in the commissions in my point of view to expose that. Um, but I support this charter amendment. I believe it's for the better of San Francisco. I believe no matter who is mayor, um, that we should support this type of charter amendment. And whether it's structural reform or otherwise, I don't think that we should be afraid to challenge the status quo in City Hall and what we believe is not working. And I'm happy to do so. Thank you. We're, we're out of time, but I wanted to give um, um, give you a few minutes to do a sum, summation um, and give us your best case on, especially since it is a rank, rank choice ballot, um, why progressives should pay attention to your campaign. Well, I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, again, thank you for hosting. Um, thank you all for being here this evening to listen to me. Um, I will just say, because we're in the, you know, at the Harvey Mill Club here tonight, again, on the eve of his birthday, and, and very much cognizant of that, um, that my track record as a supervisor and as mayor, and knock on wood next year's mayor, is unapologetically, unapologetically in support or of, of our LGBTQ plus community here in San Francisco. I've done it through legislation, I've done it through my words, and I will continue to be that person and that individual in elected office as mayor next year. Um, in terms of support on a ranked choice ballot, look, ranked choice voting is gonna come into play no matter what candidate um, you're talking to here in the city of San Francisco. And what I will simply say is, we might have disagreements from a policy perspective at times, but I prided myself when I was a supervisor and as mayor of working across the aisle at all times to make sure that individuals on the board, when I was a supervisor for seven years, even if we disagreed on 95% of the issues, that we would work together on that last 5% to make a huge difference for the residents of San Francisco. I believe that tone is missing inside of City Hall today. I believe we need to find ways to work together. That's what people pay our salaries for as elected officials. And that type of leadership, working across the aisle, making sure that not only City Hall, but the city of San Francisco is an inclusive city, an inclusive city government is what I will fight for and why I would hope to be on your ballot as well. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for Thanks, everyone. Mark Farrell. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, we This meeting, uh, please come back for our next meeting and uh, please join us.